over the last few years have really gotten interested in accelerators and incubators and the success of the hacks and bolt and, and, and Kickstarter really allows you to, to participate in how hardware is actually being developed. I'm quite optimistic that there's going to be more and more local electronic startups, more and more as kind of the idea of the Internet of Things broadens out and people really start to work out what that actually is and what it's for. There's going to be possibilities for small players and individuals to compete. I'm Simon Holmes Accord. I've been tinkering with electronics and computers for a very long time. For the 2000 Olympics, Telstra did an advertisement for TV where they showed a farmer monitoring their troughs and farmers I spoke to said they wanted that solution and asked me to go out and find it. I found out that it was just a demonstration. It's all just a mock-up for the TV, but the farmers still wanted it. And uh, we realized that if we wanted a solution like that, firstly, there'd be a demand for it, but secondly, we'd have to build it ourselves. Like many businesses, LifeX started as an idea. Phil Bosch was talking to a friend of his about whether it's possible to make Wi-Fi enabled light bulbs, so control light from your phone. And uh, then Phil spoke to his dad, who has done a lot of engineering, a lot of prototyping over the years. I met John through, his, uh, through the hackerspace, and uh, the of the three of us uh, did some initial prototypes, a couple of other fellows got involved, and uh, a video was made. And then in uh, September 2012, the, uh, the Go button was hit on the Kickstarter campaign, and whilst we had had quite modest expectations of maybe raising $100,000 over a couple of months, internet lightning struck, $1.3 million was raised in five days. It was quite a surreal experience watching the funds uh, pour in. Uh, just over the first 12 hours uh, uh, and as we hit our goal. After that, it became apparent that we had to deliver uh, maybe 10 times what we'd originally had expected. My name's Sarah Last. I'm CTO and co-founder of Mimic Tech. We're an ag tech startup that does robotics in the poultry industry. For want of a better word, we've made a robot chicken. So we use robotics to replicate the key features of maternal care in commercial poultry sheds. And the impact is an improvement to bird welfare, but also an improvement to financial the financial return for growers. And we specifically look at the first week of life. My name's Brian Gilbert. I have a day job as a web developer in my after hours at the moment. I work on a product called the Zesty Nimble, which you might be able to see in shot here. It's an extruder for 3D printers. It's the smallest and lightest direct drive extruder, which is done via having the stepper mount mounted remotely in a drive cable. So I'm Liam Brennan. I'm a Year 9 student at Box Hill High School, so I spend a lot of my time programming. So Liam's an unusual person. For even for the, this generation of kids in that he's not really happy unless he's learning and making something. He's a kid who will go off and learn a new programming language because he's just interested. So it turns out that Liam is highly, highly motivated when it comes to tech. And I have definitely looked into electronics quite a lot in the past. I've built up quite a few projects, some of which at the uh, Hackerspace. Liam was the kind of person who really wanted to know about all of that kind of stuff, so it was fairly natural to bring him along to the Hackerspace and see what he wanted to do. And Liam grabbed a soldering iron from the age of seven and hasn't looked back. So with the investment, you know, instant company forming, we had a good mix of people in terms of so people from more entrepreneurial, people to do logistics and marketing, uh, some en engineers, some people brought on to do uh, firmware development, also the uh, the harder task of going to China to design for manufacturing and get the electronics underway and uh, off we went. So my name is Noor Mukesh. I am a principal strategist for a startup. So my role is mainly to build a go-to-market strategy and also information security strategy. So the startup's called Panorome. So they are IoT a startup, so they're developing a product that's actually based on Internet of Things uh, technology and also cloud security. And they've been working on the idea for more than 12 months now. So currently it is under production, so we're doing live testing for that at the moment. My name is Tom Partridge. I'm a mechanical engineer here at uh, Tectonica Australia. I design products for the Defence Force, so military grade electronics and prototyping. So we try to do as much in-house prototyping as we possibly can. Well, Freetronics, it started on my kitchen table and it really came out of interest in a book that I'd written called Practical Arduino. I had a whole lot of people contact me afterwards saying, how can I buy parts related to this? And so I thought, well, I'll put together some bags of parts and maybe make some PCBs. It'll be simple, just a little hobby thing to do on the side. I didn't expect it to go anywhere. So we started a company uh, called Observant. I worked with an engineer and a businessman over in Western Australia who had had the ideas and had built a very early prototype of it. I brought in my friend uh, Matthew Pryor, who's also been on State of Electronics. Together we, uh, we, we applied what we'd learnt uh, in how to build enterprise systems in Silicon Valley with uh, practical electronics to build a hardware and software solution, the company called Observant, that allows, uh, allows farmers to monitor and control all sorts of infrastructure on their property. To my great surprise, I had a whole lot of people buying products, like starting off with simple prototyping boards and 
then onto more and more elaborate products. What's happened over time is that Freetronics has been has become a company that has gone far beyond that original concept and now manufactures open source hardware related to Arduino and we also do things related to Raspberry Pi and ESP8266 and various other devices that are popular now. I mean, I guess it is a startup. We've invested money and it's returning money already. It sort of grew out of, I backed a printer in Kickstarter, which is over there. It delivered, which is good for a Kickstarter, especially for 3D printers. Because they did so well, they got it manufactured in China. I'm not sure if they went over there or not in the factory, but there were some quality control issues and I pretty much ended up rebuilding most of the whole printer. But I also started a Slack community for other backers of that printer and made some good friends and in particular Lickler Shapers, who's my business partner in in the Zesty Nimble project and he's based in Cyprus. So we worked together for approximately two, two and a half years before we met each other in person. We designed an entire printer but bought the Nimble to market because of logistical issues of doing a Kickstarter on a full printer. We thought that was a bit adventurous to try as the first exercise. My name's Kamal AJ. I'm an electronics engineer amongst other things. Been involved in a number of startups, did some computer science, ended up um, at Monash Uni doing a PhD. At the time we started the company, the Asian supply chain was difficult to access. So we drew a lot on local resources and there's an incredible amount of talent that came out of the automotive industry. We worked with some contractors uh, in, in Melbourne to put together our first prototypes and we built our first systems here in Melbourne. There isn't that many manufacturing facilities in Queensland just mainly due to the cost of labour. So most people want things for cheaper so we, we have a smaller manufacturing industry in Queensland here but we we like to build things ourselves as well. It's progressed from the kitchen table to the design being done primarily out of my workshop. I do prototyping. I also do short run manufacturing. For the very small runs like prototypes, I just work under the microscope. I've also made myself a little desktop pick and place machine, which fills that niche where you might want to make 30 or 50 or 60 boards. And it's not really worth going to a factory in China for that, but it's way more than you'd want to do sitting for days at a time working under a microscope. What I'm doing is slowly working up my capability in terms of the volume that I can produce. And also we do production in China. So we work with factories around Beijing to do PCB manufacturing uh, board population, which is PCB assembly and packaging and you know, printing of instructions and all those sorts of things. Yeah, we put, a, put the, the Nimble up on Kickstarter initially and almost reached our goal. And I'm kind of glad we didn't because we were able to email all of the people who had backed us when we did bring it to market and didn't end up having to pay the percentage that gets taken by fees and Kickstarter, etc. At Fab9, we say start small, think big. When I say start small, meaning you can do some rapid prototyping in the maker space or in, in the hacker space communities. If a pro maker is interested in entrepreneurship and starting his own company, I think there needs to be ways to engage on a, globe, on a global scale. It's definitely a really interesting time to be involved in electronics. And I think the key, the key factors in that are access to inexpensive manufacturing capability in Asia. You no longer need to be a big company to deal with the PCB houses and the assembly houses and the component supply chain. You can do that as a hobbyist because people are going out you know, on the frontier and starting to develop those linkages. So I've been aware that China was a resource for, for some years. I started to hear about places like Shenzhen and the, the dynamics of the place. The idea of what I thought China Chinese manufacturing was, was this kind of big thing, you know, this big process, this thing that only big companies could do and it was really inaccessible and you had to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of um, units being manufactured to think about China. So I never really sort of entered my consciousness that I would want to visit and have a good look until I started to hear things. I didn't know what to expect. I think I was a lot more concerned about intellectual property and, and how, uh, how it might leak out before I went on the trip. I think also I was a little bit concerned about the language barrier and also the cultural barrier. And I thought that it was a, you know, it was a place you went to if you, uh, if you wanted to trade off some quality and take on more risk. So that, they, were, they were my concerns going, going in. This is really, really important to, to own up to the fact that we all have our prejudices, we all have our, our preconceived ideas of what we might be facing, and they're all wrong. Their expectations and my expectations were not going to align particularly well and that we were kind of inevitably going to offend one another. I was kind of, you know, a little bit concerned that maybe Chinese manufacturing wasn't going to be for us. Shenzhen is an important place to go and visit for, for someone even at my late stage of career. And the reason is that 
It is a different way of doing things. But the other is the nurturing of new ideas. I think it would be something that we could learn a lot from. I've dealt with prototype manufacturers in the past in China through the products that I've, I've done, but it's kind of an invisible wall. You just have to cross your fingers and you have faith that what you get back is going to be right. To get underway with design and manufacturers, many things have to be done, but one of the key parts is to find a manufacturer or a factory in China that suits your needs in terms of uh, their ability to build at the scale that is uh, appropriate and also a costing and to be able to source parts and have the right engineering resources uh, as part of their organisation. More often than not, you do rely very heavily on their ability to solve problems for you, either around packaging or the uh, thermal thermal characteristics or the uh, power supplies particularly. You know, we needed a universal power supply that would work everywhere in the world, different frequencies and, and voltages. Those are all challenging problems. That, uh, if you've got a good factory, a partner, that's really important. If you look at someone, say, in my position that needs to maybe do another startup, why wouldn't you go to a place like that to get involved in their ecosystem, their support structure, take advantage of, of their knowledge to progress your product? Vela joined us to teach us how to formalise our manufacturing and how to offshore it. So she had had a lot of experience in, in building product in Malaysia and we wanted to understand how we could access the Asian supply chain. It sort of just really kind of piqued my interest and I, and I became quite interested in how these accelerator or the, these models work towards helping startups bridge that gap to be successful into their manufacturer and then grow into um, into companies. But it's obvious that there are lots and lots of hardware manufacturers vying for those kind of positions at the moment and trying to make their product the next one of those. From the point of view of the trip, I think part of Vela's intention uh, in doing this trip was to actually expose people to possibilities. Shenzhen is a, is a huge city. I think a lot of people actually go to Shenzhen to have access to electronics components cheaply and widely. It's where basically every electronic product on the planet is manufactured. For me, this trip was really a fact-finding exercise, so I didn't know what to expect. There's a fine line though. If you go too early and if you only want to become a, again, a consumer of electronic components, meaning you go to shop things and you buy things because you enjoy tinkering, that's very different than people who go there with kind of a purpose, with an end game in mind. I mean, one of the important things to remember is that Shenzhen and the ecosystem here is not, it's not a Disneyland, right? It's not, the purpose of it is not entertainment. It's not about voyeurism of technology and, and seeing what happens. They're businesses. If you just go there to see things uh, like a Disneyland, I think very quickly people will sense that, that you, you're not going to really provide a long-term working relationship with them. And, and I think that's needs to be mindful, right? Because Shenzhen now is so famous, like all those companies get a lot of requests. Doing business in China is brutal. That doesn't surprise me. It's really, really successful. Usually success comes um, at a cost. So don't go to China with the view that they're just going to hug you and give you a good time. No. At the end of the day, basically, they're there to do business. If you're there to do business and you've got yourself organised, that's probably a recipe for success. In trying to understand seeing how Australia can engage with that a little bit more and through my consultancy, I did a six-week study tour and I had an absolutely phenomenal time. I mean, it was just, I was, I was blown away at how engaging and connected the community was, how willing they were to engage with an outsider around hardware startups and, and looking at why it is that you know China is this fantastic place when it comes to hardware, in particular Shenzhen being known as the Silicon Valley of hardware. So just trying to understand some of those things for myself. So China, in particular Shenzhen, is kind of the home of manufacturing in the electronics industry. Shenzhen is the epic center of all the things electronics. It, it definitely feels like that when you're there. In terms of a critical mass, it's certainly the biggest. I think Shenzhen is the epicenter of electronics. Um, in my view, I haven't been to Beijing or anywhere else. For electronics manufacturing, it really is Shenzhen, China. This is where everything happens. When I was growing up, for a while it was, uh, it was Japan and then Hong Kong and then Taiwan, maybe Korea in there, and it's, it's shifted to Shenzhen, and it's been in Shenzhen for quite a while now. This is really the home of prototyping and getting products out there and technology and design and innovation. Shenzhen is the epicenter of manufacturing in the world. Shenzhen is, if not the epicenter, is certainly the place where there's a lot of access to it all. It is, Shenzhen is the Hollywood of makers. People, they have dreams. I want to make a movie. If you're talking about, like, you know, things that go in shiny plastic boxes, circuit boards, 
This is pretty much the center of it, yeah. Going to China and visiting Shenzhen the couple of times that I've been there really opens your eyes to, if you have the time, whole markets full of salvaged parts, carefully sorted and bagged up for mobile phones of every description and every generation. Being able to buy those parts, you know, literally by the gram and then they're taken away somewhere else and installed into phones and sold out. That there's this tremendous amount of <laughs> components. This is the heaven for, for electronics market. And the reason why people are interested in coming to Shenzhen and like to get access to the manufacturing service here or even to find some parts from here, like the components. We have a, one of the, I think it's the most famous uh, electronics market in the world called Hua Changba Electronics Market. Walking into the first building, I just assumed that was the only building because it was the biggest electronics market I'd ever, ever seen. Later on we found out that this was just one of, we never found the end of the buildings, it feels like it goes on forever. It just stores after stores after stores of, cell, of components. In terms of the electronics aspect of it, the diversity is huge. At other times when I've gone to places like Shenzhen on my own, I'll often spend days wandering around the markets and a lot of time can go by and it's productive but you really don't get access to a lot of places. I think the draw card for me to want to really want to go on this trip was probably Vela and the people who you know I was talking to who were also going to go. I took something like 20 plus meetings in three weeks and I only had a couple of those organized before I left and everything else just kind of happened on the spot with people just getting out of their phones, quickly setting up the next introduction and, and just moving it through. And so it was this great experience of being able to uh, share knowledge and learn and, and really understand a little bit more about what it takes to have a successful ecosystem. So what happened earlier this year is I bumped into Vela. She was giving a very passionate, inspired presentation about her trip to Shenzhen in 2016. She'd uh, gone to the Maker Fair, I think, and visited many factories and come home very passionate about wanting to take other people on, on such a tour. So she was well underway. When I came back to Australia, I thought, OK, I've sort of got this extra bit of knowledge and I'm interested in some, this space. What am I going to do with it? When I sort of started to talk to a few other people about the study tour that I had, some of them said, well, if you're doing this again, <laughs> we'd like to come along. <laughs> One of the people that made this comment was uh, Simon Holmes Accord. Bella went to China late last year and came back. Um, well, I, I wanted to go on the trip uh, and I couldn't make it that time. But when she came back, she showed me a bunch of photos and I said, if you're ever going there again, take me. And it kind of got me thinking about the fact that perhaps that there was a group of like-minded individuals who would be interested in going to China and learning about manufacturing and those sort of things. But I could actually make this a reality in a standalone trip and that was sort of how the idea of the tour came about. I'd, I'd wanted to go to China for a long time just to, to demystify it, to understand how the manufacturing supply chain works. And when Vela put together uh, the concept of a study tour to China, I was really excited to be a part of it. I could probably actually make a trip for others, take them along and sort of have a little bit of that sharing of culture and knowledge and experience, build on the relationships that, are, that I'd formed, but also demystify a little bit around that engagement with Asia, which I know is still difficult for some people in Australia. And so it seemed to make sense just to offer some assistance to Bella because uh, if a very details oriented person, very organised and uh, it would be good to see her succeed. What really appealed to me about this trip in particular, even though I've been to China a few times before and seen other factories, was there was a very tight schedule visiting a whole lot of different factories and suppliers and it gave me an opportunity to see factories that I wouldn't normally see. To me, uh, from the participants point of view, it's about bringing together a group of people who are either making products or are thinking about making products or just exploring Shenzhen as the ecosystem. There, there's nothing that they don't have and it's accessible. Our school obviously offers China tours and things like that but this kind of tour is much more focused on a group like myself, that kind of maker or hacker mentality. And of course I went there for the parts to get access to some components, bought a whole lot of ESPs, things like that. It's a learning process about the factories and how the manufacturing kind of pipeline works. If you come here with an idea of what you want to build or even a, an inkling of idea of a product or something that you want to do, the whole interaction makes a lot more sense. Right, and, the, and, and what you get out of the ecosystem is a lot more fruitful at the end of the day. So if you take a tour of a factory and you think you could actually use the factory and can start asking like questions related to how you can improve your design or how you can interact with them, you know, I think the factory owners are much more happy about that. They feel much more like engagement. It's like a wait, not like you're wasting their time. Without a doubt, of the people that, that went, every one of them had the intent of doing something. I could kind of have a bit more of a soft landing into Chinese manufacturing. So some of those issues of it being a big, like a big monster of a thing that's really hard to do and really complicated kind of, I felt a little bit 
bit more secure knowing that I had someone kind of almost to hold my hand a little bit who I could kind of you know interpret what I was seeing. It's not a boyish exercise, it's not just basically something that you go and have a look at and move on. It's something that you can actually make concrete use of in your business and in your, whatever your future endeavors might be. I can come to Shenzhen, I can find some parts like different chips, components, and also I can talk to the factory. The factory owner here is very open. Like we say, it's Sanzai factory, but actually they are very open. And now we also have a second generation of factory owner, and they are very open mind to work together. As an individual, though, I, I would say it would be quite daunting, right, to, to go to Shenzhen on your own because you just don't know who to talk to. Where do you start, right? There are hundreds and thousands of factories. Because entrepreneurship is a difficult journey. You take the wrong turn, you, you could go bankrupt, right? I mean, there's more people who fail than people who succeed. I mean, I don't blame people coming out just to see this because the thing is like a video or even like a 360 walk, it doesn't give you that, that smell, that sound, that energy, that that fractal detail in this this whole market there is just this overwhelming set of senses that come out of it i think there is valuable for people to sort of see but that it's it's almost a little bit just like getting really drunk and like not really knowing what happened right this wasn't it was it was a bit of a it was it was a sensory overload experience but it wasn't there was no kind of development um, at the end of the day, either for you or for the people around you. The, the outcome of this trip is definitely one of education. It's not, it's not a, it definitely wasn't a tourist event. For me, um, I was there to find partners. I mean, we were there specifically looking to manufacture and there are a few other people in that space. One of my biggest motivation of joining the tour is, is to meet and network with other Australians. Because guess what? It's actually not easy <laughs> to meet like-minded people um, in, in Melbourne. The trip was set up as a, a visit to the what you might call the, the Silicon Valley of electronics manufacturing in China. In short, the purpose of the uh, Shenzhen Innovation Tour is basically to give uh, local people the opportunity to discover Chinese factories, the markets, uh, accelerators, and just the opportunities there is to build products in, in China. I have never been to China before. I've never been to China. I'd like to see what they do there. So from my point of view, the Innovation Tour was basically an eye-opener as to what the scene is like over there. The Shenzhen Innovation Tour is great because it, it gives people a, a bit, a bit a bit of taste of everything. What she did is put together, I think there are 11 of us uh, who went on a tour and, and a wide range, people who had manufactured, people who were taking their first steps, people who are curious, you know, younger people through to people who've been industry, who are industry veterans. The trip started on November the 10th when we all arrived at Melbourne Airport. We, yeah, turned up at the airport, sort of we'd met the crew from the tour beforehand on one of the uh, pre-tour events. Earlier in December we'd had a meeting where we kind of met some of the people participating on the tour but not everyone was able to make it. So that lunch actually was a good starting point for the whole trip and that theme completely developed throughout the, the trip. It, it, it got better and better and better. But yeah it was kind of nice rocking up and you kind of starting to put names to faces to see who everyone's are. Luckily everybody was able to check in on time and sort of get through to the gate. So I said I knew who I was looking for, rocked up to the counter, checked all our bags in and then poked ourselves in an international slot and flew off to Shenzhen. That, that was an important anchor point to the start of the trip because now everybody knew everybody for sure. It's starting. <laughs> and arrived bloodshot at the other end. When I hopped on the plane, I was chatting to the person next to me and I was asking them why they were going to Shenzhen and they said they were going on an innovation tour and then I realised it was Tom. I got to know people who are passionate about uh, making or electronics uh, or starting their own companies. And it's wonderful, it's not just about uh, the Shenzhen, it's also about the tour participants that I learned from. I was really, really impressed by the, the, the dynamic nature of everybody that went. It was really valuable going to Shenzhen as a group, you know, apart from just the factory tours, but also to meet everybody else. Obviously we have a common theme, you know, that's understanding and recognising Shenzhen is really an innovative centre. It was a really good energy. I think all of the people got along, there was no conflicts of personality which was awesome you would expect a group that size to potentially have that but like-minded people with good temperaments I think which makes a big difference and really great start to the tour. Yeah I think there's definitely a genuine interest in doing business with China through uh, via Shenzhen. I hear people really often talk about what a shame it is that people have become disconnected from their food that most people have never been to a farm or seen how the food gets from the paddock to their plate. I think similarly, it's a real shame that most people don't know where their gadgets come from. So I'm talking about things like our phones and our cars and our computers, things that we use each and every day. Most people have never been to a factory, have never seen what it takes to bring something to market. So just as it's important 
that we connect with our food, I think it's important that we connect with our stuff.